Okay. What are you showing me, buddy? Uh-huh. All right. Revelation, third chapter. And this is the seventh of the seven epistles to the church expressing what the church conditions were in the first century just prior to the 80, 72nd coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation, the third chapter. We have seen the conditions of the church at Ephesus. We've seen that the big issue with them is they had walked away from Christ, their first love. We saw that the issue at Smyrna was a good situation. There was no correction given, but they were about to be tossed into prison and persecuted by the devil for a 10-day period, but they were encouraged to be overcomers and that they could overcome those things. And then Pergamum was brought up and the teaching of Balaam and Balak was there and they were told to repent. And those who had an ear to hear would hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And then at Thyatira, the big issue was the problem with the woman pastor there, the false prophetess who was leading the people of God astray, teaching things that she ought not to, uh, uh, <coughs> causing the people to speak and listen to the deep things of Satan. Problems, problems, problems in some of these churches, huh? There needed to be some severe repentance. This is their opportunity uh, to turn things around because once Christ comes, then the ruling and the reigning starts to take place at that moment. And then I moved you into the third chapter. We looked at the church at Sardis, and uh, they were to remember what they had heard, and the warning was that Christ would come like a thief, and they would not know at what hour he would come, but that there were those who were overcoming and would be clothed in white, white meaning the righteousness of Christ that is given to them, and then their works would follow them as a result of already being made righteous before God. And then last week, or last time, we looked at the epistle to the church at Philadelphia. Once again, there was a reference to the fact that the church of Philadelphia was dealing with a group of Jews, Jesus said, who were actually a synagogue of Satan. They were satanic in that they were trying to turn people away from the gospel and bring Mosaic law keeping back in. And Jesus himself says this is satanic and it's not to be returned to very strong. All of these epistles, very important, five out of the seven feature the aspect of Christ saying, I am coming back soon, quickly. It is at hand. I am coming back, he says, to you. So be ready. And, of course, the book of Revelation from the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, verse 3, and over to chapter 22, verse 6, verse 10, verse 12, verse 20, all speak very clearly that Jesus says, I am coming back right now. I am coming back to you, to the ones that he is writing to, to the ones, to the same generation that he died in. I'm coming back to fulfill uh, the uh, type of the high priest that is spoken of in Hebrews 9, verses 24 through 28, as the high priest would have to be seen uh, the second time by the people coming out of the holy place and seen uh, by uh, the people the second time so that they would know that the sacrifice was completed and that he was not killed by God by doing the sacrifice incorrectly. But it was necessary for Jesus to fulfill that exact same type and to be seen the second time. And so this is the theme. This is the theme of Revelation. Out with the old covenant. The temple is being destroyed. In with the new covenant. The new Jerusalem. The bride of Christ that has its origins in heaven and comes down out of, uh, of heaven from God. And God and his son live inside of that church, the bride, so that there is no temple, there is no altar, there is nothing of the machinations of the fabrications, the physical things of the old covenant because now we walk in the spirit and that's the, the focus in all of this. So, last letter today. Part 7, church conditions at the first century return of Christ. Now we come to the conditions at the church of Laodicea. Laodicea, Revelation 3, starting at verse 14 all the way down to 22. Going to read it for you now. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, 
the amen, the faithful and true witness. The beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him, will dine with him, and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, if you're, uh, if you're being sharp, and I'm sure you are, you're aware of the fact that this is not the only place in the New Testament where a reference to the church of Laodicea is made. There, are, there is another place, specifically Colossians 4, verses 12 through 16. Wouldn't be a bad idea to take a look at it. Colossians 4, uh, verses 12 through 16, right after Philippians in the New Testament. Some final thoughts there that are given. Interesting because... <coughs> This church, very much on the heart of the Apostle Paul, Colossians 4, starting at verse 12, Epaphras, who was one of your number, means he was a member of the church there, a bond slave of Jesus Christ sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings. Also, Demas, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. So there's a woman there in the church uh, who opened up her home, and that's where the church at Laodicea met. He says something interesting in 16. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. So... There's a, an epistle out there floating around, I guess. I don't know. Very interesting because you know what's tied into this? Some of our oldest manuscripts uh, regarding uh, the Ephesians uh, uh, epistle, some of our oldest manuscripts do not have t the phrase to the Ephesians there. Papyrus 46 from the year 200 doesn't have it. Um, Sinaiticus doesn't have it. Alexandrinus doesn't have it. And later on, it was sort of fill in the blank. And there are some scholars, very interesting, that speculate. And, and I can see their point to a certain degree that possibly what we call the epistle to the Ephesians is actually the epistle to the Laodiceans. And there's some interesting stuff in regards to that. But that's a side issue right now. That's just meant to sort of, you know, make you go, hmm, can we go down that road? And I say, hmm, no, because we're not over on doing this. Laodicea, Laodicea means the rights of the people. The people's rights. Can everybody do this? The people's rights, right? Oh, my gosh. I mean, and the people, they kind of act this way, you know? The people at Laodicea, they're kind of that way. It's like I have my rights. We'll see how this kind of comes up. Laodicea, as you already heard a couple of remarks in the epistle itself, was a wealthy uh, city, and there were wealthy people in the church itself. And of course, this, this, um, this, I, this desire for wealth and pouring on the riches and I want to be rich, that's trouble. And it got them in trouble. We'll, we'll return to that uh, idea as we move through this. Now, like the church at Pergamum that was dealing with a local snake cult, 
called the worship of Asclepios, Asclepios, excuse me, Asclepios, that exact same religion was going on there in Laodicea. One of the reasons for that is it was tied in directly to the medical school that was there. And of course, we've talked about that whole symbol in regards to the snake that surrounds, you know, the stick and all that kind of a thing. What is it though? The caduceus. The caduceus? Okay, say it to me again. Caduceus. 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 In any case, that symbol goes all the way back to what was happening in Pergamum, and it's tied directly into Asclepios, the worship of the cult in Asclepios, which we talked about earlier. Also, the Greek word pharmakia, pharmakia, from which we get our English word pharmacy. pharmacy. pharmacy yeah was originally the word that was used to express witchcraft, um, not only by the Jews who were speaking Greek, but also uh, the Greek-speaking uh, Gentiles as well. And it had a lot to do with the different types of drugs and herbals and that were used to alter the mind and get into a sort of... A, semi-psychotic state, uh, mind alteration, and that was a part of the witchcraft scenario. They were dealing with that in the city of Laodicea in particular. The medical school there in Laodicea developed this thing that later became known as the Phrygian eye salve or Phrygian eye powder. And apparently, it, for people with different types of eye-related ophthalmological uh, uh, problems, apparently this stuff worked pretty good. I don't know. It's, you know, we're going back 2,000 years, so who can say for absolutely for sure? There's nobody around to give us much any kind of testimony about that. But the city uh, and the medical school there was known for this eye salve. And you've already heard Christ make use of that that reference to that eye salve, he'll do that at the bottom of verse 18. We'll spend some time with that when we get to it. But the church was filled with spiritually proud people. We see that in verse 17. You look at verse 17 and Jesus says that they said, I am rich, I have become wealthy, I have need of nothing. Um, Christ, as a result of this, gives a strong picture of removing them from himself. Bottom of verse 16, he actually uses the phrase, I will spit you out of my mouth. And then he is rebuking them. In verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove. Elegko in Greek, it means to rebuke and discipline. We'll talk about that. Which then basically gives us and leads us into the idea of the three last points in the outline where we see that what is really being described here in three ways the Laodicean state has to do first of all with compromise, second with corruption, and third with correction. Compromise, corruption, and a correction. Later on, uh, the very term Laodicea or being a Laodicean uh, was used to describe individuals, Christians, who had fallen into a state of a most spiritual, serious uh, state of falling away. Um, to be in this state um, as it is, as we see this throughout, actually the seven letters, really comes down to the idea of what Jesus speaks against, and that has to do with being balanced. Normally, we hear that word and we think, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? But let's see what Jesus has to say about this idea of being balanced relative to his gospel, relative to his word, his doctrine, and relative to the way that believers are to live. It's anything but balanced because Christ's teaching itself is very extreme. It's very extreme. Um, when the people of the world or in the church like to use the phrase balanced, it usually means something's about to get compromised. Nine times out of ten. But we'll see how that how that goes in regards to this. So first of all, let's consider verse 14. And as is always, finally now the last time, each one of these epistles starts off <clears throat> with the condition of Christ himself, where he speaks something about himself that he brought up earlier to John in the first chapter. Now he applies that specific thing to the church that he's writing to, in this case, Laodicea. And there's a condition of Christ we need to consider. Look at verse 14. He says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, to the agalos, to the messenger, right, to the teaching pastor, as I've been showing you, write this, put this into writing. 
uh, the importance of, of uh, Christ's word and that which he inspires and that which uh, is to be tenacious, the tenacious aspect of the inspired text that never goes away is written. It's written. So to the teaching uh, uh, pastor of the church in Laodicea, write, and he expresses himself as this. Christ says, the amen. The faithful and true witness, New American Standard says, the beginning of the creation of God says this. He introduces himself as that which is absolute. The Jesus that you worship is the amen. That word means to do more than just agree over a proposition of a thing. We're at the end of a prayer or the end of a, uh, of a statement that's maybe a biblical statement, something true about God. You will hear people say, amen, amen. It's a word of sealing. It's a word that seals something into reality. It establishes that it's something that is to be believed and is to be embraced. It is to be lived. And we are saying, yes, that's God's will for our lives when we say the amen. And so Jesus introduces himself as the amen. He is the one who seals all things. And he is the secondly faithful and true witness, it says right here. And of course, chapter 1, verse 5, he introduces himself as that. It says, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Chapter 19, verse 11, does the same thing. Jesus is the faithful and true witness. Nobody is more faithful than Jesus. You may or may not like where you're at right now in life. But you have somebody who is full of faith towards you. He is to be depended on. No matter how you feel, no matter how down you ever get, he is full of faith towards you. He is faithful towards you. It's, it's, you can choose to rejoice in the midst of the amen who seals his faithfulness to you in all things. In the, you may not feel like it. And see, that's our problem, is that we're too busy being led about by our bodies, by our flesh. Jesus transcends past that. He says, I'm faithful to you. You can feel and live and be joyous because of my faithfulness. Not only that. I seal my faithfulness to you as the amen, but also I am the true witness, he says next. I am the, I am the marturas. I am the one who sees and knows and says a thing is true as opposed to a thing being false. I bear witness to the fact of all things that are true, and I'll be faithful to tell you the truth. I'm never going to lie to you, Jesus says. I will never bear false witness to you. I am the faithful one, and I seal my faithfulness and my true witness to you with who I am, the amen, the one who seals and establishes for all time and eternity. And then he also says something else about himself. Bottom of 14, New American Standard says that he is the beginning of the creation of God, and he says this. That's a really unfortunate translation. It sounds like Jesus is saying he's the first thing that ever got created. He's the beginning of the creation of God. That's really too bad um, because, and here's one of those spots, you know, in my favorite translation where, you know, it doesn't just stub its toe. I think it falls down on its face. Jesus is not saying that he's the beginning of the creation of God as if in English it's being communicated to us that he was in some way part of the creation and that he was the first thing created. That's, of course, contradictory to all of the other passages that speak to him as being the creator. But it's our key right here, the E-R-K, the creation, um, beginning or begin is not a wrong translation of that word, but we choose definitions and various possible definitions for words based on the context in which you find them. Here you would not translate it that way. Not the beginning of the creation of God, but rather we would reach for another legitimate lexical definition like origin, the origin of the creation of God. Or the source of the creation of God. That's correct. And so now look at, look at how Jesus is introducing himself to the Laodiceans and to you and I this morning. What does he seal to us? He seals to us the fact that he is ever faithful and he's never going to let you down. People will. Jesus will not. 
Second, he's the true witness. He'll always tell you the truth. He'll never bear false witness to you. He'll always bring the absolute establishment of fact to you so that you can agree back with his being the amen as he seals this to you. And the last thing he introduces himself to us as is he is the source, the origin of the creation of God. Not only does he seal that to us relative to physical creation, but also spiritual creation. Spiritually creating you and I together. So with the physical, yeah, you've got John 1 verse 3 where Jesus is the creator. You've got John 1 verse 10 saying Jesus is the creator. How about Colossians 1? Verses 15 through 17. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 17. And also Hebrews 1, verses 2 through 3. Hebrews 1, verses 2 through 3, just to give you some quick references, that he's the creation, creator of all things. He's the source. He's the origin. See? So if I need, if I need something, what am I worried about? Why am I stubbing my spiritual, mental, and emotional toes all the time? Jesus will create it for me. Jesus will take care of it. He's the source. He's the origin of all creation and everything I need, including me being a new creation, catesis, in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Same idea that's going on right here. Therefore, verse 14 is establishing that everything Christ is about to say to the Laodiceans and to us is sealed. It is faithful. It is true. It's coming from the source of all creation. So we have to pay attention to this, this first condition of Christ. Now, just that stuff right there, man, that's a lot right there. And we could go deeper into that, but we've got to keep moving through this epistle because we're finishing today in regards to this. Next time we fire into Revelation, we'll actually be into the vision itself starting in chapter 4. So let's move first from the condition of Christ to now secondly... Oh, the Laodiceans, a condition of compromise. Looking at verse 15 now together, he says to them, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Pasukros, uh, because uh, we got that pasi, that's the, that's the letter, that's what you call the letter in Greek that's in front of this word. Pasukros. Pasukros is that which is cold. Um, relative to what? Relative to verse 15, I know your deeds. What kind of deeds are they? They're cold. They are without warmth. They are without the heat of the zealousness and the boiling. Zestos for zealous means that which boils. There's something missing here. There is a heat there is a depth and a passion, a spiritual passion that goes deep that is missing here, he says to the Laodiceans. And I don't like it, Jesus says. They were producing deeds of indifference. That's what a cold person is. A, a, a Laodicean Christian, so-called, that produces deeds of cold or producing deeds of indifference. It doesn't matter to them if they do it or not do it. doesn't matter if they obey or not. Okay, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll go out and I'll knock on doors, you know, with the pastor. If the pastor gets off my back, yeah, I'll show up at church. The pastor gets off my back, you know, oh, yeah, okay. So my wife wants me to go to the Bible, so eh, I guess I'll go, you know. It'll get her off her back, you know, kind of a thing. And All right, yeah, here's some extra money, and I'll throw it into the offering plate. These are acts of a Laodicean when the heart is unmoved by the passionate uh, facts and realities and spiritual truths that move God's heart. Where God wants us to participate with him in the things that move him, that are important to him. Indifference. And they were neither cold nor hot for Christ. Specifically cold against him uh, it was actually worse. Now hot, that's zestos. He says here, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. Zestos. It's the idea of, of boiling. Hot, not just hot, but I mean boiling. Uh, 
in Romans 12 and verse 11, Romans 12 verse 11, Paul says to us that we are to not be lagging behind in diligence, but to be fervent in spirit serving the Lord. The word fervent there is zestos, to boil. We are to boil in spirit serving the Lord. Is, is that going on with you? How are you doing with that? Do you get up every day and say, Lord, today I get to boil for you? <laughs> of course, you know, no boiling starts off bang, f hot, just like that. I mean, just like when you go to boil water on the stove, they say a watch pot never boils. You can all s s bear witness to that, right? Because, I mean, it's a slow deal. I mean, eventually it gets going, right? And they're just like you and I. But see, get the burner turned on in, in the mornings. Get the thoughts and the thinking and the words as you put your swing your feet out of bed. And you begin to say, Father, I praise you in the name of Jesus who saves me from all of my sins, from him who loved me, who elected me, predestined me, who will never let me go, who seals himself to me as faithful. And I mean, the more you do it, the more this stuff just flies out of your mouth and just begin to worship him. Throw your hands up in the air like the Bible says to do and love him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and open up his word and begin to feed on it and begin to more than just read it but interact read it. And I mean, you know not just in one little ah, just read one little passage and then that's good enough for the day. What are you, a legalist? Because all Laodiceans are legalists. Nobody gets anywhere with something like that. Zestos, boil. Jesus says, you're certainly not hot, <laughs> and you're really not cold either. Really? Not cold? Paul tells me to be zestos in spirit, serving the Lord. Um, archaeologists tell us that in the hills above Laodicea, uh, it was known for its uh, hot mineral waters, and the springs would bubble up in these hills, and the Laodiceans um, would arrange and uh, work out an aqueduct kind of a situation where the water, this hot mineral water, would come down into the city. Well, by the time, of course, it bubbles up out of its source, and it's coming down, it's several miles away, but it's coming down into the city, and of course, it, it's cooling down, isn't it? You know, the more it gets away from its source. The more you get away from your source, the more you cool down. By the time this hot mineral water gets down into the city, the people were known, now the people who lived there knew not to, I mean, you use the water for various purposes, but you certainly wouldn't drink it because not only was it just filled with, I mean, some people like mineral water, you can take it, sir, but I mean, this was like heavy duty sludge that would come down, right? And, uh, and uh, it, 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 apparently some of the Laodiceans like to hang around and watch travelers come through who didn't know about this. And they'd stick their hand in that thing, take a drink, and blah, 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 spit that stuff out of their mouth. And it's like, it's pretty funny, I suppose. Jesus is using that, this analogy that would be known to them. So because he says in verse 16... Well, actually, 15, I wish that you were cold or hot. So, 16, because you are lukewarm, because by the time the water would get to them in the city, it would be lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, what's the reaction? But I'm in balance. I'm neither hot, I'm neither cold. I'm not freaking out, and I'm not, you know, church of the frozen chosen, right? I'm balanced. I'm in the middle. He says, because you're neither and because you're lukewarm, because you're balanced, he says, I will spit you out of my mouth. I will spit you out of my mouth. Lukewarm is a kliaros in Greek. Kliaros. It's tepid. It's that which is halfway. Halfway. Nothing worse than a lukewarm shower. Come on, right? Or a cup of coffee that isn't hot. You know? Uh, so uh, occasionally Guinness gets a little attention at our house. Guinness, the, the Irish beer, okay? And uh, so some of it comes home and it goes into the fridge. And I'm saying, you know, and you're probably aware of this, you know, Guinness is not supposed to be drunk cold. 
it's supposed to be room temperature. That's how they, that's how they originally, you know, brewed this thing. And so when you drink it, if you drink enough of it and it's cold, well, you get used to it. But it's not like the way it was originally supposed to be. Originally, it was supposed to be room temperature. Um, in a case like this, it's like that's how you want it because it was made to be that way. But guess what? Christians are not made to be room temperature. Christians just are not. We're not made to be lukewarm. When you're born of God's spirit, it's zestos. It's an earnestness that we press towards. In Christ, there is no halfway Christianity. People who are not on fire, Jesus says, you make me want to puke. Because uh, whether you say puke and you don't like the sound of that or spit, either way, we are eliminating. He is eliminating something from himself. <laughs> That's what he's doing. He's eliminating something from himself. At least with unregenerate people, you know who the cold are. And so then I have to ask myself this question. Am I zestos for Christ? How do I know that I'm hot, that I'm boiling for Christ? Well, number one, Psalm 69 verse 9. Psalm 69 verse 9 tells me that zeal for God's house will consume me. Zestos, boiling for God's house will consume me. Well, what's that? Well, that's the people of God. That's you, my concern for you. That's a test. Am I, am I zestos? Am I boiling for God that I need to be concerned about God's people? I need to be in fellowship with them. I need to be talking with them. I need to be with them. When I have the opportunity to be with them, that's the issue. Together we come together. You know, this thing on YouTube, that's okay. You know, for people who are outside of our congregation, it's certainly never, ever to be a replacement for fellowship as the New Testament expresses it in physical locations. We need to be in touch with one another, speaking to one another face to face, putting our hands on one another's shoulders and praying, laying hands on on people and people need to look into other people's eyes when they're talking to them. And this ridiculous Facebook thing, I mean, it has, I suppose it has its place, but you know what? A lot of people, you know, they're not real on Facebook. It's not real. People end up being something other than they really are. They pretend. There's no pretending in the church of Christ, there is no pretending in the church of God. Zeal for his house will consume me. And that's zeal for the things that God says are to be going on in his house. Uh, uh, 1 Timothy lays out what's supposed to be happening, how God wants to be worshipped when the people of God come together. And you're not going to find things in Paul's instruction there via the Holy Spirit, you know, about bands, for instance, or about uh, puppet shows or some sort of extraneous weird things. You know, I, uh, I mean, it's, it's about preaching the word. When we come together, it's about praying together, he says. It's about singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs together. It's about praying for one another. It's about taking care of the widows, those who are truly without family in the church. He talks about that in the fifth chapter and, and other things as well. Does zeal for God's house consume me? That's how I am to know if I am zestos for Christ. I'm going to give you another one. If I am zealous for Christ, and I'll be zealous for his word. There will be a zeal, a boiling for his word, according to Psalm 119 and verse 139. Psalm 119, verse 139. And thirdly, thirdly, my zeal should stir up other believers to be zealous for Christ. My zeal should, well, once again, I got to be around people, right? I've got to be with people. Oh man, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 2 speaks about that. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 2. Now let's look at this bottom of 16 right here. If we've looked through all that and the intensity of what Jesus is saying, because you are lukewarm, neither hold nor hot, cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Literally the Greek is melo say imesai. Melo. You recognize mellow, the verb about to, and it is about to in this case, uh, as opposed to certainty, because emesai, for spit or, or puke or vomit, same Greek word, by the way, same word. They've just cleaned it up here with the word spit, so it's a little bit more acceptable. But Jesus said what he said. Emesai right here, the mood is in the infinitive, therefore mellow that follows it, it's about to. He says, I'm about to spit, say, that's you, say, out of my mouth. I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. In other words, you're 
lukewarm behavior does not validate that you belong to Christ, he says to the Laodiceans. Your lukewarm behavior, your balanced behavior. I want hot people. I don't want you cold, but at least if you were cold, it'd be clear that you were unregenerate. There'd be no fuzziness about it. You're out. You never were in in the first place. But when he talks about spitting you out of his mouth, your lukewarm behavior does not validate that you belong to Christ. Removal from Christ's body, spitting you out, is to bring about a repentance once one is spit back into the world. And we saw some of this once before. 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5 with the man who had his stepmother. Dad is dead apparently. And he's having a sexual relationship with his stepmother. Paul can't believe it. Verses 4 and 5 of 1 Corinthians 5 says, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are assembled, and I, with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. We, we've learned elsewhere from other passages that the idea of delivering one over to Satan means to deliver one back into the world so that there would be a time of discipline. You are disfellowshipped uh, from the body when this sin will not be repented of and you just refuse to stop. And people in the church, the, the elders and the people in the church, you know, we've gone through the, the Matthew 18 scenario, you know, and you still haven't repented. Um, note Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses uh, 15 through 18. It's all about, you know, so that you'll turn around and repent says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. In other words, we're heading towards a trial here. We're heading towards people who will give testimony before, in this case, the church. 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, then let him be unto you as a Gentile and a tax collector. That's excommunication. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. It's the binding of somebody either to the church in recognition that they belong to the church, or it is, it says, when you, whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven, recognizing that you need to be loosed from the assembly because you're not behaving in a forgiving manner. In this context, like the text talks about, if two of you agree on earth as touching anything they ask, well, the two here in this context are the two individuals who are bearing witness to what they have heard this other person refusing to bring forgiveness to another person in the church. And the excommunication here is just like it is, the, the point is just like it is here, it is the same as over in 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, to bring that person into discipline so that they come out of that scenario. You can make a note of 1 Timothy 1, verses 18 through 20. 1 Timothy 1, verses 18 through 20. Also Titus 3, verses 10 through 11. Titus 3, verses 10 through 11. Might as well note Romans 16. Romans 16, verse 17 through 18. We already saw earlier, I made reference to Revelation 2, verse 5. Revelation 2, 5, where John says, therefore, remember from where you have fallen, repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. The lampstand, of course, was the churches. That was the figure of the churches. They're the seven churches. He says, I'll remove it. I'll remove the lampstand. The whole, that's the whole church. Unless you repent. In this case, they need to return to their first love which was Christ Jesus. Which brings us to the third point in Revelation, the third chapter, as we move into verse 17. Now we need to talk about this condition of corruption. The condition of corruption. Look at 17. Why am I spitting you out of my mouth? Because you say, I am rich, and I have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Jesus now says, and you do not know that while you're thinking you're rich, right? You're actually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Five things. Five things as opposed to your three things. I, have, I am rich, become wealthy, have need of nothing. Someone who is about to be excommunicated does a lot of confessing along these kind of 
these kind of things. See, people who get to this point in the church of excommunication, they've reached a point, the third step right here, where they're kind of like indifferent about the whole thing. It's like and many of the times when they're called to come before uh, the voting membership of the body, one more attempt to try to save this person, to bring them to repentance, to demonstrate that they are in fact Christians, that they are in Christ, a lot of times they don't even show. They don't even show to this for this this uh, this third step. Um, I, I, in fact, I, I I haven't seen anybody yet show up to this third point. You know, they usually run away. We had a uh, couple years ago, was it three years ago or something like that? We had to deal with a, a gentleman who uh, we had ordained into the ministry, and he had fallen so far away doctrinally and refused to listen to me and refused to listen to others who were bringing witness to him, and we had to call a special meeting because we're the ordaining parties here and um, try to get him to come and face these charges. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, it's, what do you think sin is? You think sin is just sort of something that's hunky-dory or something? You know, people don't like those words, you know, charges. We're bringing charges. Well, what do you think it is? You charge somebody with something that's a serious sin, of course we call it charges. You know, people don't understand in the Reformed, in the reformed uh, uh, faith that this is the biblical procedure that, that we follow. Anyway, this guy wouldn't come. He wouldn't show up. He refused to do it. So we had to deal with it in absentia. So he couldn't answer to any of these things, which means when he says, I'm not going to show up, he's basically, by default, you know, saying that he's guilty. So that it is what it is. And so he was defrocked. And his, his ordination was removed. And his, his attitude was laughing. And he thought it was ridiculous. But that's what they do. People who are in sin will expose themselves sinfully by treating something as seriously like this as if it doesn't matter because that's their defense at that moment. Inside, they know they're guilty. But that's their defense. What do they say to Christ? And why is he about to spit them out of his mouth? They say, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. You know what that means? That means I don't need God. I'm rich, I got money. Become wealthy. I mean, that's in a number of different areas. I got, I got lots of things happening. Got my own business, you know. I'm working with the stock market. I got income going on right there. The wealthier people become, especially when it comes to money, the less dependent they become on God. Tell me I'm wrong. The Bible says in Psalm 62, verse 10, Psalm 62, verse 10, we are given a direct warning. It says, if riches increase, do not set your heart on them. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. See, too often of the time, people think setting your heart on the riches, well, that means, you know, um, I'm thinking about them all the time. You know, you know what setting your heart on riches is? You won't let go. You won't let go. When somebody is in need, when you know about situations and circumstances, and you could make a difference, well, how do I know that God is calling me to do that? If you've been made aware of it, and you have the ability to fix that person, to help, their, to help them, God's calling you to it. <laughs> this is not difficult. We start making all kinds of excuses, you know, not to let go. If riches increase, don't set your heart on them. Somebody that doesn't let go of their riches, when God brings the opportunity, is somebody who's setting their heart on them. Proverbs 23, verses 4 through 5. Proverbs 23, verses 4 through 5. This is a fascinating passage speaks about the fact that we are to not work hard to gain a lot of money. Proverbs 23, 4 through 5 says, Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Another translation says, Do not work hard to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. Cease thinking about it. How am I going to earn more money? You know, kind of a thing. When you set your eyes on it, it's gone. What do you mean? For wealth certainly makes itself wings and like an eagle that flies towards the heavens it just goes away 
I mean, how many people, how, how many of us have been told, especially by our fathers, you know, you know, just to, and there's nothing wrong with hard work. Ecclesiastes is loaded with that kind of admonition. But when you're working to gain wealth and to build up wealth in this kind of a thing, you're out of touch with God. Well, I know Christians. I know Christian men who are blah, 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 blah. Really, you want me to make a choice between Scripture and your experience with some guy? Really? I mean, that's rebukable right there. You know what I'm talking about. Ecclesiastes 5.13. Ecclesiastes 5.13 says, Hoarding riches will bring harm to you. And in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10, riches... And the desire for riches, the desire for riches will bring you into temptation. It will bring you into traps, foolish desires, destructions, many griefs. And then Paul says to Timothy, O oh man of God, flee these things. He says back in Revelation 3 verse 17, he says in the middle of 17, and you do not know. See, lukewarm Christians, they don't know their true spiritual state. In fact, they make plans to make sure that they are not in the path, like right now, they are not in the path of anybody telling them about their true spiritual state. <laughs> they don't want to face it. He says, and you do not know, bottom of 17, that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked, which he'll speak more about as we get into verse 18. Look at 18. I advise you, he says, to buy from me three things. First, gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. What is gold refined by fire that you may become rich? Well, 1 Peter 1.7 says that that gold is the persecution that aims at the trying of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes. 1 Peter 1, 7. He says, buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can truly become rich. Paul wrote about the Lord Jesus in 2 Corinthians 7. He says, though he was rich, yet he became poor, so that we, through his poverty might become rich. Secondly, middle 18, I advise you to buy for me dot, 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 white garments so that you might clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. Look back over at chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, he says, but you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. See, they're not compromising people. They're not lukewarm people. They're not balanced people. People who walk with the Lord in white are boiling. There's us, us. He who overcomes will thus be clothed, 3.5 says, in white garments. And we found out when we studied that passage that that has everything to do with the rewards and the reflection of faithfulness during your stay here on this earth. And he says, I will not erase his name from the book of life. Looking back at 3.18 one more time, 3.18, we clothe ourselves in these white garments at the shame of our nakedness. That's like no rewards, being naked before God after the Bema seat. It's like no rewards. That's, uh, that's uh, 2 John uh, verses 7 through 9. 2 John verses 7 through 9. And lastly, he says at the bottom of verse 18, not their nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve, buy for me, I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. You, you think Jesus is actually trying to sell them some kind of a, you know, product here, you know, as seen on TV. You know, Jesus, as seen on TV. Here's your eye salve kind of a thing. No, it's the ability to see and hear. It's verse 22. 22. He who has an an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. It's the same idea. He who has an eye, let him see what the Spirit says. Jesus says, better to pluck out the eye that offends right now and get saved, right? And then go through the rest of your life on earth with just one eye. It's better to do that. Spiritual truth and spiritual beauty and spiritual passion and the zestos and the weight of it and the knowledge of the spiritual truth is more valuable than any kind of physical body part, he points out. 
which is, is a difficult thing to say and, and much more difficult to hear, which brings us to the fourth and final point then. Verse 19, this final condition now, that's this condition of correction. He says, now those, verse 19, whom I love, I elego, I rebuke them. New American Standard says reprove, that's fine. We usually don't use that word much anymore, but it's to rebuke. It's to rebuke harshly, sometimes with warnings, sometimes a rebuke with penalties. Elegco that's going on here. I love you. So here comes the sharp end of the stick. Because I'm mean? Because I'm nasty? No, because I am conforming you to me. Those whom I love, I reprove. And discipline. One of the most unloving things you can do when you're raising a child is to not swat them on their butts when it's necessary. And you do it publicly. Who cares what other people say? Right there in the high V. Oh my gosh, parents, you're so weak. So weak. You're always afraid. Somebody's gonna, somebody, I'm gonna report you to the, shut up, report. Here's my driver's license. Bend over, I'll smack you on the butt too. <laughs> He says, those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. Therefore, be zealous, zestos, boil and repent. Do you have zeal to repent? We talk about zeal for a lot of different things. Zeal for the gospel, zeal for the word, zeal for your brothers and sisters, zeal for the truth of, of this and that. And da, 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 da. Well, that's great. Do you have that same zeal to repent? When you need to turn away from a thing, when you need to physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally turn away from a thing and, and deliver yourself out of its hand in your life, do you go after that turning away, that repentance, in a zealousness, in a boilingness, if you will? Are you passionate to get rid of that thing that the Bible refers to as sin in your life? Is it? He tells me to be zealous and repent. Final thoughts now in verse 20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door. And I knock, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in to him, will dine with him and he with me. This uh, verse is so abused in evangelical Christianity. Um, behold, look intently, let it fill up your eyes and your heart as a result. I stand at the door and knock. If he's standing at the door knocking, that means he's not in. Right? Uh huh. And he's writing to who here? Laodiceans. And he says, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I mean, there's just one picture after the next about, you know, the danger of, of, of losing your place in Christ. If they really are of the elect, they are God's people, then they will respond to the rebuking in verse 19 and the discipline of verse 19, and there will come a zealousness to repent. If they're not, if they never were his in the first place, well, it's not about losing one's salvation. 1 John 2, verse 19, it says, those who leave the church, John wrote to them, he says, those who leave the church, if they leave, it's because they never were of you in the first place. And Jesus says, I'm standing at the door, I'm outside of this, because Jesus doesn't live inside a lukewarm. Jesus doesn't live inside of balance. I, I've said this to you so many times. You read through and study through the gospel. This is the most unbalanced man I've ever seen in my life. In all of history, Jesus was the most imbalanced person. There's nothing balanced about him. He's walking on the water. How is that balanced? Sinking? Is that somewhere in the middle or something? What, what the heck? You know? He's casting out demons. How is that balanced in our society or in any society for that matter? He's raising the dead. He's telling the people to pick up their cross and follow after him. Are you crazy? It's a crazy thing to say. It'd be like me saying to you, pick up your electric chair and follow after me. Put the noose around your neck and follow after me. Who's going to do that? But see, that's the extreme of Jesus. And of course, what he meant by that is dying to yourself. 
being willing to suffer like I'm about to suffer in the most horrible, heinous way, execution through crucifixion. There was nothing worse. And that, that, that threat of crucifixion is how the Roman Empire kept all of the nations under them under control because that's what they would do to people. Slap them up on these torture sticks on the roads that lead in and out of cities so you could see what Rome does to people that do not follow or troublemakers and break the laws of Rome. They, they were not playing. Jesus says, pick up your cross. What? What a horrible picture to give my children. Really. You see how we need to get rewashed and reworked in our thinking relative to the things of God. We're so busy conforming ourselves to this world and to the thoughts of the fallen system that we're missing out on God. We're going to stand before him, I'm afraid. And we're going to end up being those people that say, Lord, didn't we do many mighty works in your name? Do miracles cast out demons? I never knew you. I never knew you. I never had relationship with you. Because you never picked up your cross, because you found that repugnant. Because you thought it was more important to strike a balance, and can't we all just get along? No, Jesus, don't you remember when I said I didn't come to bring balance? I came to bring a sword and divide up families. Shoot, James Dobson, focus on the family. What an ungodly name for a Christian organization. Well, focus on the family, focus on Christ. And your family will get it together. Teach doctrine. Your family will get it together. Don't compromise. Train those kids up in the things of the Lord, which means no compromise, which means no balance, which means boiling and zestos. Jesus is here. <laughs> he says, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. What? He's knocking? He's got a let. He's knocking. He's got to let us know he's there. We're so lame. We're so blind. We don't know he's standing out at the door. He's outside. We don't know he wants to come in. He's got to knock. And then he says, if anyone hears my voice, tis is the Greek word. If a certain one, tis, certain, a certain one hears my voice. Not anybody and everybody, but he's talking directly to these Laodiceans. It's not general. You can't use verse 20 as a general or something. If a certain one hears my voice. Well, John 10, 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. The reason you don't hear my voice, he would say to the Jews, is because you're not my sheep. You've got to be a sheep first. Sheep being a sheep is not the result of believing on Jesus. You have to be a sheep first in order to believe on Jesus. Jesus taught in John chapter 10. So if a certain one hears my voice, it's because they're elect. And those that don't, they never will open the door, but they'll maintain that church. And they'll maintain the balance. Well, if that certain one hears my voice because he's my sheep, he opens the door. I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. It's not about salvation. This is about fellowship. This is about the restoration of fellowship. He says, I will come in to him and will dine with him, will depnuo with him. And that's that same Greek word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians the 11th chapter for that, that, for that long meal, that leisurely meal. That's that same word that they used at the end of the day, you know, when they would all come, the day's work is all done right now, and we're not running back out. You know, day would usually start off with a quick, fast little slurp and bang, as the sun is rising and out into the field you go, and then it's lunchtime, and it's just stand there and eat something really quick, and then get right back to work and what do we mean lunch hour what are you talking about lunch hour that's not the reality of Jesus's world the reality of Jesus's world is you eat while you're working and keep at it and then when the sun goes down forget this union stuff and then when the sun goes down and the work is all done you can't work anymore because it's dark because it's dark 
Not because it's 3.30 in the afternoon and you've been at it since, you know, 7 or whatever like that. You go home and now it's over with and now it's depneo and we're taking our time and we're lounging around the table and that kind of a thing. He says, that's what I will come in. I will dine long leisurely meal in deep fellowship and he with me. That's what I'm promising you. He says, I'm promising you, Laodiceans. I'm not promising you more money. I'm not promising you more influence or affluence. I'm not promising you a better job, a better car. I'm not promising you any of those things. I'm promising you me. And that's the dividing point right there. Jesus is the dividing point. Because when it all comes down to it, those who are in Christ, all they want is Jesus. And those who are faking it and are trying to be balanced want things. They want Verse 17, riches, wealth, needing nothing. Jesus has different plans. 21, he who overcomes. Overcomes what? Overcomes the Laodicean spirit, the Laodicean attitude. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. So rulership. And we saw that in 2.26 through 27. 2.26 through 27 is he's promising to the Thyatirans. says, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. That's now, folks. I also have received, as I also have received authority from my father. Comes up again in chapter 20 and verse 4. But in 3.21... I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, stop. Do you have an ear to hear what he just said? Does, does that matter to you? Is that something that makes you go, oh man, that's a, that's a better, that's something I want. That's, that's better than any Christmas present or anything like that. That's incredibly better. To sit down with Christ, with his father on his throne? Really? What are all the implications of that? Certainly doesn't mean you, you are worshipped or something lame like that. But it has to do with ruling and reigning. It has to do, eh, you can't even take care of your own body and rule over your own thoughts. You want to rule over nations? Somebody might say, well, you know, I, I, actually, no, I really don't want to rule over nations. Well, that's because you're in sin. When you don't want what God wants for you, it's sin. Well, what, what do you want me to do? You want me to be balanced? You want me to stroke you with something? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's an imperative in Greek. You better Hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to all of the churches, all seven of them right here. Because guess what? After these things I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Because any way you look at it, the vision of the revelation is going on. God's plan for his kingdom is moving forward. And he has done everything through his son to bring us along in that. The door is open in heaven. Time to walk through it, but not walk through it as a Laodicean. Now, Laodicean, they don't care. You know, they're not cold, they're not hot. You know, they're being all things to all men, so that by all means they might serve all men. That's what they're doing. But the standing open door in heaven is different for those who have ears to hear. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to ask, Lord, that you help us to be not, <laughs> not balanced. Lord, we want to be boiling like your word says for us to be. We want to be in earnest, oh God. We want to be in earnest. And, Father, we will do what it takes to be in earnest and to be boiling for the things of thy church, the things of thy son and thy spirit, the things of thy kingdom, oh God. May we really think long and hard, Father, about this and that we don't turn away from the things of your people and the things of your church and replace 
zealousness for the things of the word with zealousness for the things of my job. Lord, may we not be idolaters, compromisers that cut across in that way and walk away from these things that you call us to. Lord, help me in regards to this. Help my house in regards to this. Let us serve you, Lord God, craving to serve you, Father. And Lord, you said that as we put you in your kingdom first, all the other things that we desire will come to us. Help us to prioritize, Lord, and take to heart the message to the Laodiceans, Lord, as we have received it today. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, that for those whom you love, you rebuke and discipline. Thank you, Lord, for the rebuke and the discipline today. I certainly need to hear it, Lord. Thank you so much. Give us continued ears to hear this rebuke and this discipline so that we don't end up being falling into uh, the Laodicean curse, as it were. Thank you for these things. And Lord, we praise you. We praise you, Lord, now that your word has gone out into the hearts and minds of your people here at Messiah Church. Let it go out now, Lord God. Uh, out into the world, Lord, to other states, to other people, um, to uh, other nations, Lord God, via YouTube. Bless the ministry of the word in this way, Lord, so that the knowledge of the word of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the, the oceans, Lord. Let it be so, God, and let Christ be raised up and his word be preached and understood truly and repeated faithfully, O oh God, so that you are pleased, so that all of this world, Lord, comes under the control that is clearly that which is born of Christ. Lord, I thank you for these things. I ask, Lord God, that you bless your people here today as we seek to glorify you. Lord, anybody that's feeling sick in their body, loose them from that, oh God. Loose them from that and let healing come into their hearts and minds and bodies in the name of Jesus. For those, Lord, who are who are down right now because they think that uh, I'm, I'm one of those Laodicean guys that Pastor Birch was talking about, then, Lord, let them be freed uh, from the uh, from uh, the uh, the condition of that, Lord God, by confessing to you where they are at, by confessing to you, O oh God, and let them experience your forgiveness and your freedom from that sin. Give them new hearts and new minds and new commitments, Lord God, to follow hard after your word, to dig deep on a daily basis, and to worship you and put you first, first Lord, without compromise. Bless them for that, Lord God, because you have to do it with all of us, Lord, sooner or later, at one time or the other. And I thank you for that, Lord. I praise you for that. For those, Lord, that are in financial need today, Lord, we ask for you to truly uh, be their source and be their supply and meet all their needs according to your riches in glory. We trust you, Lord, to do that. For those, Lord God, that are suffering mentally, emotionally, oh Lord, we speak the peace of Christ and ask, Lord God, that Isaiah 26 would be theirs as they are setting their hearts and minds on you. Let your peace reside in them and rise up within them in the name of Jesus Christ. Let your thoughts be their thoughts in accordance with the word. Thank you, Lord, for these things. And as we turn just to bless you now, Lord, and to, to keep the ministry of the word going here at Messiah Church, Lord, as we take up the, the morning offering, I ask for your blessing to be upon your people as they are giving, Lord. And if anybody is not able to give today, enable them to give another time in another way, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for how you meet all of our needs and you take care of us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you build up the finances here so that we might see more money head towards uh, Lance's kids down there in Africa, Lord. We trust for you to do it and thank you for it all. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. Go ahead, Lynn. Praise the...